Tonight's being co-sponsored by uh, Transition Bay is one and the Deanery is the other one. Um, and we'll give you a little bit of background on both. Uh, maybe just to start out with Transition Bay, uh, for some of you that may not know, we're part of an international uh, network, the transition movement um, internationally. Um, it's uh, it started in 2005, I think. There's some 9,000 uh, transition communities around the world. Um, and we primarily work at the local community level to build resilience uh, in the face of an increasingly fragile world largely around the three E's, economy, uh, environment, and energy. So we do a lot of workshops like this over the course of the year. A lot of it has to do with just good skills building at the community level. So uh, the previous workshops, we did gardening, uh, we did seed savings, fermentation. We've done quite a number of off-grid workshops, uh, things like that. So tonight is all about um, stoves. Um, and these are particular kind of stoves that are, give you a lot more resilience if the power goes out, for example, or if you're offsite, uh, you, need to you, know, you need to implement for some reason, uh, still get your cooking done. Um, so this is just some really good basic skills to know. Uh, quickly, I could let you know that we've got some events coming up um, in the future, um, we are doing a group ordering of fruit and nut trees. Um, you can go to our website, find out about that. There's a deadline of April 21st to or order uh, trees. Um, we have a presentation on victory uh, gardening um, at a mini expo. It's gonna be live streamed. That's on May uh, 13th, the Thursday uh, from two to five. And then guess what? We're 10 years old this year. Amazing. So we, of course, have to have our 10th birthday party. So that's going to be a big gig. We're planning it. Uh, it's going to be in June 6th. Uh, we're still trying to pick the venue. We're going to have an enormous birthday cake. We'll see what COVID does, but we're going to try and have a big celebration. Open mic, whatever else we're going to do. So stay tuned for that one. And uh, It'll be coming out on our newsletter and you can always stay tuned on our website. Um, as part of our um, uh, co-sponsoring for the evening, I'd like uh, uh, one of the people from the deanery, either Mark or, or Mike or Kim, if you could say something about the deanery and, if there's, uh, and what the upcoming events may be. Well, we have Kim on the line, the uh, CEO of uh, the deanery, so. I like to defer to her because she does a wonderful job of it. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> we'll tag team this. This is great. Um, so it's so excited to be here. This is awesome. We don't do this enough, Bob and um, Transition Town. And uh, I am so excited. I didn't realize it was 10 years for you. It's 10 years for the deanery this year as well. So really? wow. I think we need to figure out a, a joint birthday party. We can do it twice. We can do one with you go. guys and then you can come and do one with us. So Perfect. Let's, okay. let's figure that out. Let's yep. talk. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, for anybody who doesn't know, the Deanery Project is an environmental arts and education space. We're located on the eastern shore of Nova Scotia, uh, about 60 kilometers east of Halifax. And uh, it's a beautiful property. We've got, um, we do land-based permaculture design projects here um, all year round. And um, then, inspired and following kind of parallel paths in some ways with Transition Bay and uh, we are also kind of a transition definitely a transition place of, of, of note we think. So we have um, some good things coming up. One that's really fun is uh, there's a bicycle machine challenge for anybody that's interested in building bikes. We're trying to get people out doing connecting with bikes and things like that in different ways. So we're building a bike powered pump to get water up onto our living roof so we can grow our vegetables and things up there. Um, but anybody that's got a lurking 
machine something bike powered machine in a corner somewhere and i know there are many of those uh you can dust it off and uh put it in we've got prizes and uh, it's it'll be a lot of fun so that's on our website and you've got till the end of uh april to do that april 28th um our program director charles williams is doing a digital facilitation workshop series which is pretty interesting for anybody that's trying to learn about uh, getting familiar with Zoom, the kinds of things that we're doing tonight, but um, doing that in a very community-centered way, and they're a lot of fun, and they're also um, ways for, we found that they've been a good team-building experience, like, so if you've got an organization that wants to figure out how to bond a bit <laughs> through this, that has been quite good. Um, we're, we do our open houses the first Sunday of every month, and uh, this go around we've got a um, uh, we're going to build hoop uh, some hoop garden uh, tunnels hoop tunnels and then in the afternoon we're making homemade ice cream and there'll be a little ice cream social that'll be happening then and then um in sort of going forward we've got uh a number of natural building workshops there's like a series that'll be happening in in May and June, both are uh, permaculture based and um, and then we have a lot of um, plaster and there'll be a cob make cob oven making workshop as well. So yeah, check out the website and uh, we'd love to see you all there. Thanks. That's great, thanks, Kim. Okay, let's get the show on the road. Um, what we're going to do, we've got about an hour and 15 minutes. We want to make sure we've got good time for discussion at the end. So what we'd like to ask is as questions come up, put them in the chat box um, and then we can pull all those out. Um, and we are going to try to save questions um, after the end of both presentations. So first, I, first up is Cam Farnell is going to be speaking about solar cookers. When I think about energy, the first person I think of is Cam. Um, he spends a lot of time. He, if you ever want to go a deep dive into the uh, um, anything to do with energy, uh, whether it's liquid fuels, um, living off grid, take your pick. Cam's your guy. Um, he knows quite a bit about uh, all of that. He's made presentations on it uh, in Transition Bay, and I am not surprised when I found out that he's got a number of different solar cookers. And as I understand it, you recently cooked lunch on some of those sunny days that we had. So we would like to learn more about solar cookers and I'll turn it over to you, Cam. Okay, thank you very much, Bob. Uh, yeah, I'm interested in energy. I would not call myself an expert on solar cooking. I'm someone who dabbles with it, but I've had a little bit of experience about it. Um, all right, let me get my screen up here. We'll see what we need to do. Stand by, there we go. All right, we're talking about cooking from the sun. The sun is in fact remarkably powerful. You don't, you don't think of it as being all that powerful. We just think of it as being the sun. But in fact, in bright sunlight, you're picking up about a thousand watts per square meter. Well, how much is a thousand watts? Um, uh, an electric heating, plug-in electric heating unit like this draws about a thousand watts on high. So you're getting enough energy to run one of those for every square meter of sunlight. Um, the big problem with sunlight is that although it's powerful, it's spread out. Um, that little cooking unit there has a surface area of, of maybe a tenth of a square meter but you've got sunlight spread way out over it. So the part of the deal you need to be doing when you're solar cooking is concentrating it. Um, there are a number of advantages of solar cooking. For one, the sun is free. Um, there's little danger of setting anything on fire. It's, you can, but it's, but it's not, uh, not easy. Um, and the sun is available when other fuels aren't. We all know that fossil fuels aren't gonna be lasting forever. And even wood, which is readily available now, if we tried to replace all our fossil fuels with wood, we'd be running out of wood pretty darn quick. But the sun's going to be there for longer than any of us need to worry about. So it's a, it's a good thing to consider for cooking. 
uh, disadvantages. Um, it costs money to buy a solar cooker. Uh, you can build your own. That, that uh, gets around the cost barrier. Uh, it only works on sunny days. It doesn't work on cloudy days. It doesn't work mm -hmm. at night, so it is limited. But, uh, but that's rather offset by its other advantages. Um, so how do, how do solar cookers work? Well, there's three things they have to do. They have to capture the energy. They have to concentrate it, and they have to keep it from, from going away. And typically, they use reflectors to reflect this extra sun one way or another into the cooking device, and then often insulation so that you're, um, you're keeping the heat in. Um, there are also, by the, while we're talking about this, there's also solar dehydrators, but that's a separate issue that we will, um, that uh, is really not part of this discussion, but you can, you can do solar dehydrating as well. Um, okay, we're going to talk about three different kinds of solar cookers tonight. One is the sort of conventional oven type that's pictured here. Um, in this, you've got uh, some flat plates that re reflect sunlight into a box that's insulated and covered with glass. We'll get into that a little bit later. We're also, there's also the parabolic type where the sun's rays are focused on a relatively small spot and you can use it to, to heat a pot or whatnot. And there's this thing, which is a go sun, which is sort of a, it's sort of a cross between a, a cooker and a thermos bottle. And we'll, we'll talk, talk about those. All right, first thing we're gonna talk about is the solar oven. Now, full disclosure, I don't have one of these. I've seen them used, I, I know a bit about them, but I'm covering them here even though I don't have one because it's probably one of the most popular and widely available types. You can get them from all over the place and there are lots of instructions available on the internet explaining how to, um, how to build one of these or you can go out and, and buy one. The one in the picture is a manufactured one but it's entirely possible to build one with mod, relatively modest skills. So it's a box with a glass lid. Uh, inside the actual oven unit, it's painted black to help absorb the sun. There's reflectors uh, around it to gather additional sun, and there's insulation to keep the, keep the heat in. Um, <clears throat> at the end, I'll have a link to uh, an article that talks in some length about this particular cooker. Um, it's got advantages. It works much like a conventional oven, and it's not bothered much by wind or cold. Um, some solar cookers, you've got to worry about this. This one, you don't. Um, the disadvantages are that it's a really only good for baking. It's not, not, uh, not good for much else, but you can do a great deal of, uh, of cooking and various things in this sort, sort of solar cook, cooker. All right, we will move on now to the parabolic cooker. All right, there is a, and this I do have, this, this is my uh, parabolic cooker there. You can see the silver thing in the middle there is the cooker. It comes as a series of plastic uh, sections that you snap together, and then uh, you've got the whole thing once it's all snapped together. It's, it's about uh, three feet in diameter. And in here, you can see I've got it attached to a board so that you can change the angle that it's at and you can move it side to side. Uh, there's a lot more sophisticated ways you can do, do both the controlling of the, uh, the reflector and holding the pot. This was stuff that I've sort of just jury rigged up, but it does work. Um, where are we at here? All right. Um, yeah, it's, it's basically sort of an oversized uh, satellite TV dish, but it's reflective. So it, it concentrates the sun on a relatively small spot. I'm sure as, as kids, a lot of people have taken magnifying glasses and used it to, to heat up sun to burn paper. This is sort of an oversized version of that, but it uses mirrors rather than a lens. In, in this case, I've got it focused on a griddle. Uh, when the griddle itself is held by some angle iron that's connected to a work table, and I've got a pot upside down on it because as you can see, there's snow in the upper right corner there. This was earlier this week when it was still cold and snowy. Um, the pots keep the wind off it. What we were doing there was we got this griddle heated up and put some sausages on it. And this thing does get it hot enough that you can see in the subsequent pictures here that it's actually, it's actually cooked those um, sausages quite well. We had to keep moving them around lest they burn. And in the back there, there's an egg that we, we uh, scrambled up just to see how that would work. 
it looks a little bit dark because it was cooked in the same pan that the um, sausages were, but the whole thing worked fine. Um, you've got to be a little bit careful with that thing because it does concentrate the sun's rays and you can't see exactly where it's concentrating them. So there's some danger of you sticking your hand or whatnot into where, where, the, where the rays are concentrated and you find out about this pretty quick. I had a, a plastic uh, infrared temperature gun that I inadvertently pointed that thing at and then very quickly moved it when I saw it starting to smoke. So yeah, it's, it's relatively powerful in that sense. I, as part of testing it, I held a piece of cardboard up to it and was able to set the cardboard on fire just based on the, uh, based on the, uh, the heat that was coming off of that thing. So it's, um, it, it's, uh, it's interesting. It, uh, it took, I think we probably had those sausages on there for, I don't know, 20 minutes or so. It, took, it takes a while to heat up and because it was winter with a bit of a wind, it wasn't setting any records for cooking things, but it, but it did work. And if you, if you were into that with any degree of seriousness, you could set up a little better system for orienting the, uh, the mirror and for holding the, uh, the griddle. All right, we're going to move on. The, the third one, and this is another one that I've got, it's a thing called a gosun. And it's basically the, in the middle of it, you can see there's a glass tube. It's the, the black thing sort of in the middle there with the handle sticking out of it. It's evacuated glass tube into which you can place food. And the, because it's evacuated, it's very much like a thermos bottle. And the reflectors that are on either side of it reflect the sun's rays onto that bottle, which has a dark coating, which absorbs the sun. So there's, there's the unit. You can get an idea what size it is. It's, it's about two feet long. And you can get a, a scale if they're looking at the potatoes and the scissors and the laptop computer that are next to it in that photo. So here's the, this is the tray that fits inside the goat sun. It's, it's quite odd in, in the, the size of it because the tray is about two inches wide by about 22 inches long. So you have to be a bit innovative about how you cook things in it. Here we've got it loaded up with onions and potatoes, um, which we, was part of the lunch that we cooked that day, the same day that we cooked the sausages. Um, there's a close-up of the onions and potatoes, which we chopped to a size that would fit. You can do quite a bunch of things in here. It seems very limiting, but there are um, anything that will get down to that size you can do. I mean, you, you, could, you, could, do, you, know, you could do meat in there. Right? You could do sort of a stew. You could have vegetables and meat in there. It's, it's what to the, up to the top. It's water watertight. So you can do quite a lot of things with it. Here it is going into the gosun. Um, and it just it just slides in from the end there. And there it is. That was it actually as it was cooking. Uh, it does remarkably well even under uh, adverse conditions because it is very much like a thermos bottle. Um, it could be minus 20 out and that thing would cook just fine. Uh, a lot of other solar cookers aren't at their best in extreme cold, but that's one of the advantages of this particular one is that it, it can survive that sort of thing. So its advantages are that it works well even in extreme cold. It, it is not affected at all by the wind. Um, the disadvantages are it's, it's got limited space for food. It's uh, something of an unusual shape. Uh, and like, like all purchased ones, it's, it's not, not inexpensive. It's, uh, and, it's also one of the ones that you would, could not easily build yourself. Um, there are a couple of links here that I've got. Um, the one at the top is uh, a link that's uh, to, to the conventional uh, solar oven, the very first one I showed. Uh, the woman who writes that particular blog has the thing about 10 ways she uses her solar oven. It's an interesting article and worthwhile. For the, the reflective one, I don't know where you can get one these days. The one that I got, I got a few years ago. They don't look to be in business anymore, but I'm, there are other places that make them. I just don't have a bead on them. The little one that's rather like a thermos bottle is made by an outfit called GOSA, and you can get information on that. And that was all I had on the, um, the, the solar cooker. If anybody's got any questions, I would be happy to, uh, to answer them, unless we're doing questions at the very end. I'm not sure how that's being planned, Bob. Well, maybe uh, just a couple of quick questions right now. Um, Tara and Sebastian wanted to know, uh, do certain solar cookers work better in Nova Scotia than others? Uh, well, uh, I, I don't think, well, it sort of depends. 
that the go sun is particularly good in extremely cold temperatures. And not that we get that much in the way of extremely cold temperatures here, but it does do better in the winter. Um, I suspect the solar ovens would, would do better uh, further south than here, but nonetheless, there's enough sun here that, that pretty much any solar cooker is likely to work. Um, a lot of people think that we, we don't get much sun, but we, we do, we get a decent amount of sun here and pretty much any solar cooker is going to work here, yes. And another question from them, do you have to clean the inside, uh, the thermos bottle section after you're done cooking? That, that's, that's, a, that's a very good and practical question. The answer is yes, you do. And that unit comes with a little scrubby uh, that you, it's, it's about the size of a Brillo pad, but of course it's, it's made specifically for that unit so it won't scratch the glass it screws on the end of that cooking tube. So after you've taken the cooking tube, you know, after you're done, you've taken the food out of the cooking tube, you've cleaned the cooking tube, you can screw, screw the little scrubby on the end of it and then slide it back and forth inside the tube to clean it. So it's because it's glass, it, it, it cleans quite easily, but good practical question. So I got the, how, how what was the temperature do you think outside? when you cook that outside uh, might have been five okay so it fairly was, fairly it chilly warm it was you know it was not not bad but it wasn't uh, wasn't 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 summer that's for sure so did the wind affect the parabolic cooker more than the go sun oh yeah the go sun no effect whatsoever the for the parabolic cooker of course the parabolic cooker generates as much heat but the problem is that we were heating up a cast iron griddle and the wind would cause the griddle to lose heat, if that makes any sense. I mean, if I were doing that uh, on a regular basis, I might make something that I could put under the griddle that had glass, that, so to help um, you know, glass and a little ring to keep the, the griddle up above us because the light would pass through the glass and you wouldn't lose as much heat. That's also why we had the, uh, the upside down pan on top of the griddle, just to keep, keep the wind from uh, taking away as much heat. Yeah, yeah. I think I will forever now remember that uh, one square meter of sunlight has a thousand watts. Yeah, it's 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 a remarkable amount when you when you think about it, when you figure how much how hard it is to get a thousand watts. If you, I mean, a person working really hard on a bicycle can produce a couple of hundred watts, but they can't keep it up. Um, Kim probably knows this. I'm, I'm sure if she's got bicycle activated things there, she'll be familiar with this. But so a thousand watts is a lot of power. Yeah, I heard an Olympic cyclist can barely hit uh, four to five hundred watts. Yeah, and they would be hard pressed to keep it up. Yeah. Okay, uh, one more. Uh, David had a question. Um, how season and weather dependent are these solar cookers? Well, they, they're totally weather dependent. If it's cloudy, they don't work well. Um, yeah, it, it's uh, season, season dependent, not that much. As long as there's sunshine, uh, you're, you're good. But of course, in the winter, there is less sunshine and it, you know, it, the sun is not as high in the sky. That said, virtually all of these have a way of allowing you to point them more rather than less at the sun. So it's certainly going to be more challenging in the winter than it is in the summer, but nonetheless, you can do it. And particularly the, the go sun is extremely good for that. Okay, good. Well, we should probably move on to Mike. Um, Mike, trust you're there. And uh, uh, why don't you take okay. off? My understanding a little bit, uh, um, Mike, my impression from the bit that we've worked together prior to this is that you're extremely knowledgeable. Everybody kind of pointed at you when we threw the question out there, who can talk about uh, rocket stoves? And they all pointed at you. And then your first question is, well, what kind of rocket stoves, heating, cooking, and so on? And that uh, you really have a passion for spreading the word about rocket stoves, so. That I do. Uh, over, so over to you, Mike. Good evening, everyone. I uh, hope everyone's well and doing well. Um, yes, uh, as an introduction, I have worked with the Deanery. I've been volunteering there for probably close to 10 and a half years or nine and a half years because they just started before I got involved with them. Uh, there we've spent a lot of time uh, learning and doing a lot of these type of work. So 
At the deanery, we do have a rocket stove mass heater, which we constructed five years ago, and it's a wonderful thing uh, just to heat the house. So that's not this presentation. Hopefully we could do another one at some other time with it, or if we have a little bit of time at the end, I can expand on it. But we spent a lot of time figuring out, and this is where I learned my passion about rocket stoves. Uh, prior to this time at the deanery, I played with rocket stoves, tried to learn how they do. I found a couple of videos, was just absolutely amazed at the power, the simplicity, and how a rocket stove works and how it can actually use very little amount of energy to create a large amount of heat. Uh, dived into it, uh, went down deep, probably deeper than I should have gone, uh, but it's all good knowledge. Uh, I've made lots of presentations on rocket stoves and how they work, um, so we will get into that. Uh, but one thing I like to do is just to start off with this land acknowledgement, um, just to recognize that we are on unceded territory and we are governed by our friendship and peace treaty and just to recognize that we are there and that's what we are. So if we want to get into it, if we have time, I got video, a really cool video. Hopefully I don't run over too far at nine minutes, a long video, but I will find my screen and share it all. If I go too fast, someone has to let me know. And I do live in the rural area, so I do have a slow internet connection. So you may take a little time to get onto your screen. But this presentation is on rocket stove cookers. I thought it worked. So in the presentation, we'll be exploring a short history and how rocket stoves save lives. Uh, we'll be investigating the basic designs of how a rocket stove works, how it functions, its characteristics, it's all about them. Uh, we'll also demonstrate a couple of examples, okay, many examples, different types of rocket stoves that are there. And then we, again, if there's enough time, uh, I am extremely passionate about rocket stove heaters. They are probably the best way we should a house in Nova Scotia constantly. And none of us, there's only a few that do, and that's not enough. But if we ever get going, uh, I can't see my disclaimer all the way. Got to move you guys around. Uh, a contained fire possesses risk of explosion, fire spread, personal injury, or death. So this information about rocket stoves is purely for educational and discussion purposes. I am not a professional fire engineer or a fire technician. This information presented is based on research by others and personal experience. I do not express or or make any representations concerning the accuracy likely results or reliability of the use of the information and or the materials used. All responsibility for the design, construction, use, and maintenance of any rocket stove is the end user. Prior to the construction, all final designs should be reviewed by a professional fire engineer to reduce the risk to you and to others. But that all said, fire is dangerous, fire can kill. So we do need to be aware that this is fire. So let's get started. The rocket stove has been around since the late 70s. Uh, before that, we as humans cooked on open pit fires or in fireplaces or even on a couple of stones. But generally, the most of millennium of humans cooking has been on just very simple fires. Um, and they still do it today. Guys, round again. Looking on uh, cooking on metal stoves, such as a pot belly stove, like the Ben Franklin stove, or ones that you've seen in cabins, uh, efficiency stoves, that type of stove has only been around for a couple hundred years. 
Uh, so we haven't used it very long and we don't know how we get to, and we've just, we're just learned so much that. More recently, the industrial world has switched to electrical appliances. Maybe not as fancy as these ones, but we in the Western world, industrial side, have used or have more so to electric in all our appliances, in all our cooking needs. Say, Mike, sorry to interrupt. Just one suggestion. You're, you're breaking up just a tiny bit. Okay. And what might help if you turn off your video, we'll still see your screen. Yeah. And the bandwidth will probably improve. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. That's probably true. Uh, so, like I say, we have more recently started just cooking with appliances using electric power. That's not true for the developing world. Um, they still use what's called a three stone fire. So there's three stones, sometimes four, but the, the idea of the stones is to basically support the pot and hold the fire underneath the pot while the pot's stable. Um, these are extremely uh, carcinogenic, a lot of black carbon pollution, and they have extremely serious health risks, like black lung. Uh, it changes the mortality rate dramatically. Uh, so there's, and these are for not just all the population, but a certain segment of that population. The women and the, the girls that are growing up, they're the ones responsible typically in the third world growing up is to collect the firewood, bring the firewood home and cook the meals for the family. That puts them at risk in a couple of different ways. Uh, they're leaving their encampment or their area where they're protected. They have to go out into the wilderness and they have to find the firewood. So there's uh, over clearing. They're collecting too much wood so that there is actually deforestation going on. So they have to go further and further from their homes to be able to get sticks that are good quality for burning. That leaves them more acceptable to uh, attack by wild animals or prey upon other humans for uh, trafficking or just they'll kidnap them and hold them for ransom. So it's an extremely dangerous environment for the, the women. Now that they bring the firewood home, they cook. They're breathing in the smoke because they're indoors. And that's also causing great harm and killing them them as well. So is there a better way? Uh, back in Anto Evans, he's a, a cob builder originally from uh, Great Britain, moved to the, the United States and was building cob homes, benches, and working on a uh, lots of different permaculture stuff. We now call it permaculture. They're just exploring this, what they call that now. He did a lot of work in Guatemala and Costa Rica back in the late 70s. And there he saw this issue of black lung deforestation, women being subjected to uh, lots of different kinds of dangers, right? So he started developing this, what they call the Lorena cook stove. And it's an efficient contra flow cooking stove made of some materials as of unfired bricks. So that'd be like Adobe sun-dried bricks. Uh, the work developed into the leads of the development of what we know as the rocket stove, and it is saving lives now and throughout the world. I've done a presentation to an architecture firm here in, in Halifax, and part of their work that they like to do is go to Ghana or Guyana and work with uh, some of the people there building schools or doing architectural projects there. But they also have now introduced their about rocket stoves and how they work. And that's actually turned into kind of a small business for some of the people in the area, making rocket stoves and selling them in the local economy. So it's given them jobs, it's given them something else to look forward to. Plus it's saving them a lot of, you know, dangerous situations. 
Uh, up in the right corner, that's Anto. You can actually start to see some of his drawings that he's doing where they're showing the actual contra flow and the, the rocket still design as we know it. So what is a rocket stove? A rocket stove is a contra flow fire, which means it burns contrary to what you expect it to be burning. You can see by the image that the fire actually burns horizontally. And that's done by a couple of different methodologies, which we'll start to get into. So there's three components of a rocket stove. There's a burn chamber where the fire is and is burning. There's a heat riser, which is a chimney to that. And we'll get to some of that more detailed information shortly. And then there's an insulated core, which is around the uh, heat or heat riser. And in this case, you see that there's a barrel or something over top of it. And that then takes that and starts to get that mass heater effect of how it takes that heat and stores it. So in a burn chamber, uh, you can use small sticks. Uh, anything that's uh, like kindling size, small finger size, uh, pine cones, waste wood. Um, if you do parting or, or coppicing. So those are a type of methodology where you grow a tree and you cut it down and it regrows. You can let that grow to just as wide as you want, but only you know a half inch on a diameter of twig will burn into a chamber uh, dried. So it'll take anything combustible, and that for you, you don't have to go very far to collect your firewood. If you have a small piece of land, you can just collect just the fallings and the trees that need to be maintained to have a fire in your house most of the year because they're so efficient in their burning. <clears throat> fire in the burn chain burns, depending on your species of wood and how dry it is, but the temperatures range anywhere between 400 and 600 degrees Fahrenheit. That's an average fire. And in that process, you're producing smoke, and we call that syn gas, because uh, it's simulated gases. So the smoke starts to rise within the heat riser, and it's the same thing as a chimney effect. So heat rises, it draws air through the bending into your burn chamber, keeping that uh, fire lit. It's sort of like having bellows on a, a fire all the time. It's constantly going. You don't have to blow on it. Nature is doing the work for you on this one. So as the heat rises, it continues to keep going and with the insulated core to it, the insulation will start to absorb some of that heat and become warmer. So inside the heat riser, will actually start to increase in temperature. And then once it starts to reach certain other temperatures, some of the other syngas materials will actually start to recombust. They'll con be consumed in a fire with inside this chamber. So it's sort of like having a uh, creosote fire in your chimney, but designed so. You, we're designing it actually into the system. And again, so the ventilation will, will hold that heat in, allow it to build. And the time, the height of the chimney depends on the burn chamber. And by general rules, everything changes uh, depends on the diameter, the height, the air conditioning or the air temperature, the vapor temperature, the air around you. But generally, a three to one ratio is what you're looking for. So three times the height to one time the length. Now, that's not simply the same case. Sometimes when the, you have a wider throat of it, you have to go a little taller. And it's kind of like playing around until you get the exact mix that you want. Uh, and then what it does is it burns clean. It burns most of the sink gases off, leaving water and carbon dioxide. And the temperatures in here uh, will skyrocket anywhere between 1,000 degrees, and depending on the tree and where it is. But I think it's the California uh, liptus tree. Uh, has a high bit of resins in it. And in that temp chamber, they have measured heat at just over 3,000 degrees. So 
that's pretty warm. You should be able to cook a hot dog pretty quickly on that. If you can get your hot dog anywhere near it. Uh, that's also why it's good to have the insulated core. It kind of insulates you from those temperatures. That's generally how a contraflow works. Um, if you ever seen one actually burning, they're absolutely amazing. Uh, like we had the one in the deanery, and I've had that stove running, uh, firing heat, moving along. And people have come into the space and they go, oh, this is nice and warm. You know what? What's this? Oh, this looks like a fireplace. And then they, they don't even realize that that stove is actually working. Until you look down into the burn chamber, you don't see fire. You don't see smoke because of the smoke is coming up out of it, drawing all everything out. In this case, we capture it and send it out to a different chimney. So the smoke doesn't back up into the, the space. Now you can have them in different ways. You can have your fuel bundle vertically into it on an angle, which you'll see some of the examples, or straight on. It depends on how you want to maintain it. Uh, the vertical one is self-feeding pretty much. The sticks just go in there, they'll consume, and the sticks will slowly fall down until they're done. They're extremely efficient, uh, about 99% efficient. And usually there's no ash at the bottom of it. Depends on how long you burn it. We had at the deanery the first year that was used probably three to four times during the week. And eight months later, when I cleaned out the stove, um, there was maybe a gallon of ash that I took out, which is absolutely amazing, I think. So let's talk a little bit about fire, what fire is and how it works. So we all know that fire needs three things, heat, air, and fuel, right? But the amount of heat that it needs and how that works is if you're on a colder day, the fires don't work so well. It needs time for that air around it to heat up so that it's actually available to be able to be used to. And then you need fire or a fuel. And most things in fuel are carbon based uh, materials, trees, twigs. Actually, I think everything that burns that we burn in a fireplace is based out of a plant. So the chlorophyll, the molecule that makes the green leaves and starts to build the structure of the plant is C55, H72, magnesium nitrate, four, and uh, I think it's decacontent oxide. That's how it's so in there, you can see that there's 55 parts carbon, 72 parts hydrogen, a little bit of magnesium nitrogen, and the rest of it is oxygen. So in a fire, what this starts to do is the vapors and waters in the fire will actually boil out. And that's a lot of what the smoke and steam is. You see steam coming off of the fire. The rest of it is breaking down this hydrocarbon chain and the breaks down from that big gigantic molecule to the little ones up the top. That's just in the standard fire. So that's happening in that burn chamber where the temperature is around four to 600 degrees. So from there, we're producing methane, ethane, propylene, butane, propane. There's a lots of different type of carbon fiber chains. And you can see the differences between methane, it's just one carbon, four hydrogen, two carbons, three, six, until you get I think it's, but anyway, they start to break down. And again, when they get into that heat riser and they, those temperatures start to rise, these other molecules break down again. So they, they crack, fuse off, and become basically carbon dioxide. There's still a little bit of steam coming off of it. And that's just a continuation of breakdown. So you know when your stove is burning at full value and there's no smoke coming off of this, you know that you are getting a very clean burn and you've broken all of the chains, all the molecule chains out of it. 
So that's the science part. Hope everyone's still awake. Um, so there's some examples. There's some very simple ones, like you can just make a log. You can take a four by four, you take an inch and a half auger bit or an inch auger bit, and you core down from the top, you core through the sides so to get a little L shape into it, or you have the top, you can go from the top down, do the same thing, and you set a fire into it. The log is your fuel. Again, it starts to heat up, the heat rises, the chamber inside will start to warm, causing the stack effect, and it'll just keep feeding itself. The air will just continue feeding through, like you have a set of bellows on that, and it'll burn through. And you can see that it, the insulated core, which is the wood itself, uh, that fire has been burning, they say about 20 minutes, and he's able to pick it up, move it around, take it from one spot to another, you can extinguish it and relight it later on because as long as the carbon doesn't get wet, you're fine. It'll restart. Or you'd say you have a, a hunk of log somewhere, you want to start a fire, you do the same thing. Drill a hole, cut down. Uh, there is a version that's called the Swiss log where you take the chopped wood and you bundle it together nice and tight. So it creates the same thing. Uh, a stack, you can cut a little hole inside of it, and then you can again start a torch site with that. And you can take your fry pan, you put a couple of stones on top, and you can cook sausages, scrambled eggs, cinnamon buns. And you can see from these ones that there is not a, any smoke coming off. And if it's burning correctly, there is no, no smoke. It's, perfectly clean. Another example, just construction materials. Things that are lying around from a construction site. A construction site has uh, terracotta pipe fittings, but that's just a pipe fitting. It's, a y, it's called a TY. It's stuck on a couple of blocks. You build your fire into it and doing the same thing. It's contraflowing. The air is coming through the orifices, rising in the insulated core and coming out of the top. Now, the terracotta is insulated because there's a lot of air pockets in the, that type of clay. A couple of uh, rebar pieces on top of it, throw your pot on it. Beans and rice. Hot lunch, right? right? Okay, you don't have building supplies, but you know, where have you found a five gallon bucket lately? Almost everywhere. So let's say there's a, a flood and things start floating around. Well, what's going to float? Your plastic bales, your buckets, right? You might have some cement, some rebar. So you just take the bucket, fill it up with cement, but you would place in a, some kind of a tube, like a plastic tube or a a cardboard tube that does the same thing so that these two connect to each other on the bottom so you're creating that L shape. You put your sticks into that, you got your heat riser, your insulated core by the cement, you got your burn chamber, you got yourself a rocket stove. Yeah, and they just set uh, rebar into the, the cement here so that they can put their pot on it and make a cup of tea. The splits in the buckets are just to get the the concrete out and that's the one that's just turned upside down just to give a little more height to work off of okay now you're a welder say so that's your job you know how to weld great these ones are really good ones uh, a couple pieces of uh, square tubing cut weld some fancy legs the top for your your uh, pot again and the same principle this is a horse a diagonal feed burn chamber, but they still have the heat riser. And with steel, it holds heat. So you don't really necessarily have to have the insulated core on this one. Uh, they do perform perform much better if there is a like some glass bat or some other kind of insulated material wrapped around the heat riser. They still work a little bit better. 
This one has a little bit of airflow that comes in from underneath, drawing it this way. They have its advantages because if you have too many sticks in here, you kind of choke off the fire. So a good airflow underneath is really good and necessary, but not required. The other ones you might want to raise the, the tinder bundle just up off the, the bottom of the uh, burn chamber, just allow the air to flow underneath it. You're an artist. You love metalworking. Maybe you got a little crazy. Really quite artistic. <laughs> And you wanted to scare the neighbors, never come over to your yard again. So now you have a flaming dragon in your yard. Same principles, burn chamber, insulated core, insulated uh, heat riser, nice and tall. They had a good draw of ventilation through. Kind of fun that one. You're a bricklayer. You have excess brick from all over the place. Maybe you are clear, but these are simple to build. There's just creating a burn chamber, stacking bricks one on top of each other, but on the bottom of it is open so that you can stack more bricks and create a chimney. Again, burn chamber, heat riser, the brick acts like the, the insulated core, and you can cook away. And they work in winter, no issues. They might get a little harder to start because the air is colder. You need the air to be warm to be able to get these things to work well. You have none of those experiences in the back, but as a child, you played with mud. You did a little bit of uh, work with clay. So you can take the same thing. Take a log, stick it upright, another log in on it, so you create an L. Take some cob, which is just straw, clay, and sand, mixed together, shaped, put together across the logs. When it's slightly dry, pull those logs out. You got that nice L shape again. Uh, cob allows you to be really creative in your form work of it. But then again, you just got the same thing. I think it's like a mantra. Uh, you got your Burn chamber, your heat riser, your insulated core. And again, the top, maybe they got a couple of stones in there on top of the place so they can balance off their pot. This one is really kind of, I like this one, it's called a Holly Rocket stove. He's made them with uh, pure clay, modeling clay or ceramic clays, uh, using the same concept of a couple of a uh, pipe that goes in vertically, went horizontally. They were cut at a 45 degree angle, so they meet nicely in the middle. He wraps the clay around it and dries it, fires it, ceramifies it. But what he's on his system is got a, a diameter size that he knows specifically, but he takes um, wood pulp, mashed up paper or paper pulp, and mixes it together in a slurry and then uses a uh, hydraulic press to just push all of that uh, moisture out of it inside a tube. But inside that tube, he's got another round cylinder. So there's a hole in the middle of that uh, puck-like thing. The puck fits inside the rocket stove, and you just light the inside. So it slowly burns from the inside of the core, out like just like the log did does and it goes out throw another puck into it these can be made well in advance for the nice summer coolings or season summer season where they can dry be stored in bags shipped all over anywhere sold in the local markets again it's another aspect where somebody can make that as a kind of like a little a job for themselves making these little things and they can go with the rocket stoves and they're burning efficiently and clean um, he has about 20 minutes experience on each one of those burns uh, you have a couple of old tin cans <clears throat> uh, 
I think they're called the number 10 bean can. Uh, and then number eight, like a fruit juice can. They're not so common now, but they can be used. Same thing, you're just taking the, the smaller can, you're creating an L shape with another one that cuts into the bottom of that can, cut a hole in the side face of it, connect them together. And the best way to do them is use some kind of form of insulation. Uh, rock wool insulation, bad insulation, like pink bad fiberglass, uh, something that's non-combustible, uh, even dry clay, dry, dry earth inside the container will do the same thing. Uh, important part is it's always that ratio of when you have your burn chamber, your heat riser, that heat riser has to be three times at least what your burn chamber is. Uh, we built several of these and they don't burn effectively well because the can themselves isn't quite tall enough. So if you do it, this number 10 can, if you had two of them that are stacked on top of each other, it works beautifully. We uh, built one during a permaculture uh, course at the deanery and just kind of sizes together and it was wonderful. He was burning twigs the size of a pencil and getting enough heat out of that one small little sticks to you know heat up a pot of water within probably about 20 minutes. And my favorite one, is, and the only reason it's my favorite one is because it's so simple. It's just wire, hardware cloth, chicken wire, a bunch of stones and an old flower pot broken off the on the end of it all kind of molded together that's that little uh platform where you put your sticks onto so the air comes underneath of it the inside was hollow the rocks act like the insulation core to it you got your heat riser your burn chamber you're done cooking knock everything apart Fold up the chicken wire into your backpack and off you go to your next campsite. That's got the lightest weight cook stove available. And you can make it as big pot is. So just need more rocks. Doesn't quite work out, add a couple more rocks until you get that heat riser to start working properly. Um, there is what's called the Dakota foxhole. Uh, this is the indigenous people of Dakota and other places around uh, North America have used this system. They also call it a foxhole or a badger hole. And it was basically under the same principle, uh, a foxhole or a badger hole, and they would just break open the ground above it to build their fire into it. So they've got the same thing. Uh, Typically, they're mounded on the, what you took out is mounted, so you're creating that insulate or that uh, heat riser effect. And that would be your airflow. Um, the earth is the insulated part of the, insulating the core. You can then you nice have a nice cook to it. They're good, but there's some limitations to it. You're building fire underground. So if you're in a root matted area, you have to make sure that the fire is not inside the root and slowly smoldering the forest fire. Ground is typically moist and wet, uh, things that fire doesn't quite like all that much. So it takes a little while to get one going good because you have to get a good area that's dried out. So they work. If you're in a pinch of something, um, but you can make one work. That's why I say that the favorite one is just the rocks because if you're in Nova Scotia you've got a billion rocket stoves in my backyard. Then there's also a bunch of them that actually don't fit into the category of rocket stoves. Uh, one of the questions that's going to come up is are they, stoves? they make a certain sound when they're fully burning and the air is rushing into that burn chamber, 
that it sort of sounds like a rocket taking off or you get that kind of low forceful sound of air like that sound and that's so what the other one is is called a hobo style it's the same thing it's using the sin gases to reignite within the fire to reburn to become efficient to take away uh, all of those excess carbon carbon chains that are not burnt but they do it by a different methodology. You build a fire within a can that has holes at the bottom of it uh, that allows air from the outside to come in, into the chamber. And once this chamber on the outside of it heats up, it'll start to create that draw or chimney effect that the, it, uh, the heat riser has. And it brings the sin gases above the fire and ignites it as they come out of the top. So you can see in the little image on the sides, these are all little jets of flame, which is all the smoke coming down. So the smoke will come through the fire, be drawn up the sides, out the top and reignited. So it's called a hobo style. Um, again, extremely efficient, lightweight stoves, easily made out of, but they're a little harder to make because Fussy about the holes, positioning, size of the chamber. They do sell them. This is a solo stove. I believe they were for sale at IKEA. And then the other one is uh, BioLite. Absolutely amazing company. They make uh, one of the best commercial product projects available in terms of efficiencies and burning and cooking. Uh, for the backpacker, camper, survivalist, just to keep at home for emergencies. Uh, the wonderful thing about them is they work off the same principle as the hobo stove, but the front, the end of here, they have an attachment into it, which is a thermodynamic powder. So it uses the heat of the fire to move electrons through a coupler so that you can plug in uh, with a USB connection to it, and you can repower your cell phone. So your power went out, you, got, you can charge your cell phone. There's a little light that's attachment that they can come with it so that you can have a little light. What, look what you're doing. And they also have another, a couple other attachments to it. So it spreads out the top of the fire so that you can create it sort of like a barbecue. So they're a wonderful, Wonderful invention, great company. So I don't know what time is. How are you doing, Rob? You're muted, Rob. Mike, we've got three, four minutes if you want to get into mass heaters real quick. Okay. So mass heater, this is the actual rocket stove mass heater that we have at the deanery. And the same thing is there's the burn chamber, the woods inside of it. The L-shaped or J-shaped container goes all the way up to just to the underside of that barrel within a couple of inches of it. And that's the rocket stove that we've just been talking about. So a mass heater typically takes a container, puts it over top of the top of the stove, and all that hot air you know, four, six hundred, a thousand degrees is coming up to the top and we collect it off the sides into a manifold at the bottom. And that manifold, we just pipe within a mass of material such as concrete, earth, um, water, if you can do it, it's a little more challenging, but something that has, that holds a lot of heat. Uh, earth and mass, like uh, carbon, clay, rocks, stones, and that uh, then continues throughout, loops back on the itself, and then exits out of the chimney. So all that excess heat goes into this bench. That bench will store heat for up to 24 hours, releasing it back into the space, heating the building. So the developers of these rocket stoves, Eric and Ernie Weisler, they're out of Portland, Oregon. 
they have done a lot of research and a lot of things. They've talked, they've taken Otto Evans' work, expanded it greatly, and done a lot of science to it. So in their house they have in Oregon, is this, they had a wood burning stove in there. They used it a couple of seasons. They burnt four cord of wood. They built the rock stove unit and went to less than a cord of wood. The only thing that changed was the stove. They'll light a three hour or they'll light a fire for when they get home in the evening. They'll burn that for about three hours using any size of log material that they can. And then they'll extinguish it, go to bed. And the wonderful thing of it is when they wake up in the morning, it's still warm in the house. When they get home from work the same day, it's cooler, but not cold. They write the fire again. That process just repeats and repeats. That's the basics of rock stoves and how they do it. If we can get more time, we can go into much more depth again. That's great, Mike. Um, wow, that was, I loved all the different examples with different materials. We do have uh, some questions that have come in. Um, you could probably put yourself back on video and maybe unshare your screen. Yeah, there you go. That's great. Um, I've got a question first off. I'm just going to jump the queue here. Um, you named um, uh, the stove company that makes that hobo style with the USB thermoelectric capacity. Yep. What was that name? It's called BioLite, B-I-O-L-I-T-E. And I think is a distributor, I think. Okay. <laughs> no, that's a great, idea. It's a great idea because you can cook and charge your phone at the same time. Yeah, so that's a really good survival one so that you can uh, make yourself dinner, but still be able to check the websites to see when uh, your power is going to come back on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some questions about the um, uh, the stone rocket stove. Yeah. Um, you know, where you use the chicken wire or whatever it was around the outside to hold the stones. Yeah. Um, is there um, like a second pipe in the middle or what holds the stones from kind of caving in? Smaller stones. What's that? Yeah, if you, if you had another pipe inside, that just makes it easier to stack. But you just have to get everything in nice and tight, packed in around smaller stones. Maybe it's a little bit of cob on or mud on the inside of it to create that uh, vertical ri heat riser. The less penetrations you have, the arrow wants to rise, right? Uh, so if it's smoother and more condensed and packed, the better it's going to work. So I just like that as my favorite because it's so easy to build. You don't. There's not a lot of materials. So you want to minimize gaps between the rocks. You do the, want to minimize the gaps, correct. Yeah, because you'll get air leakage and it won't be as efficient. Is that the correct. idea? Correct. Yeah. Okay, so you used a, a pipe in the middle just to get the rocks in there and then took the pipe out or you left the pipe in? Yeah, you just leave it in uh, and just stack the rocks onto it. I built that uh, version similarly to it uh, without the rocks but I built it with a, a plastic uh, coffee can. Uh, I just took uh, some paper towel holders, cut a hole in the side, made the L shape, packed it with light, uh, just dirt. And I was able to use that one. Uh, and the heat of it never actually even warmed the plastic except just around the, uh, the burn chamber itself, got a little soft. So it's the same thing, they're just, you want that chimney to be as solid and complete as possible, but you can make it work by just stacking rocks. Okay. So also uh, everyone online right now, um, what we could do is if you have a question, uh, and I'm looking in the chat box, but you could also just come off mute and uh, we could start a conversation about some of this. 
Uh, in the meantime, one question from Taryn Sebastian about bricks. Um, for the brick type of stove, um, any suggestion on what kind of bricks they were concerned that red bricks could degrade pretty quickly? And if you had any experience with that? If you're building a rocket stove cooker and you're just using it as a cooker, it wouldn't matter. If you're looking to build one that's going to last a long time and that you don't have to ever rebuild, using a fire brick, it's, um, they're, they're like bricks, but they're made in a different methodology. They're full of air so that they, they use them the same type of brick that goes into masonry heaters now, like the backside of a fireplace, that type of fire brick. They, uh, they'll last a lot longer in a, a hot environment such as a stove would have. So if you're building a mass heater, it's definitely recommended with a fire brick. Yeah. The other ones will degrade, will fall off and break apart. You know, you started out by talking about uh, dangers to women who do most of the cooking in um, different parts of the world um, where they were still using the three stone or four stone method and they still are in many parts of the world. How much of the rocket stove idea has gone into those countries? Because it seems like it would be a real game changer for a heck of a lot of people. Not enough. Uh, there is some and it is, it is spreading, but I understand that it's still spreading fairly slowly. Um, I'm not sure exactly why. It's just maybe it's again, uh, the unsureness of how, you know, another national group of people from the West are coming to show you how to do things. Um, they may not understand how to build them, what to do with them, how to move them. But the ones that are, they are getting more and more and they're just finding that they are life changers. They burn, like I say, very small pieces of sticks. So you don't have to go very far. They're extremely efficient in their burns. So you're not looking for a lot of wood material. So it's a lot uh, safer for them to be looking for firewood. Like Haiti has uh, de basically deforested the entire country from people cooking. Yeah. So and that leads to all other kinds of problems. And you mentioned how you're getting this, like a secondary burn in the heat riser. Yeah. Uh, is that similar, you know, wood stoves will have, modern wood stoves will have a catalytic converter to try to burn those secondary gases. Do you know, is that the same thing? It's, my understanding is similar, but I think uh, the catalytic converters are more of a chemical based uh, approach to it. Okay. Where, well, yeah, where the, the reburning of the sand gas is actually breaking apart those carbon uh, long chains. We're using in a rocket stove, we're using the heat of the stove, the heat of the materials to do that as opposed to a chemical analysis because it, I'm not a scientist on that side of it, but I do believe it's a chemical reaction that they're using the palladium and platinums in them to kind of convert that carbon chain down. So do you have a permanent one built at your home? I don't, but I have plans for six of them. Uh, how many? I'm sorry. Six. Six of them. Uh, it's just time to get them to build. I, I work in the city. I spend 12 hours a day working. <laughs> Come home. Not a lot of time on the weekends to do that, plus all the other things you have to do in life. But yeah, no, I would want to use them for uh, in my greenhouse as to extend seasons. I want to put one on a bench just outside our, our pond so I could heat the bench up in the winter time or the fall time to spend more time out there looking at stars and not getting cold. I would like to build a couple and to heat my garage. Uh, there's a, a website and we're going to run too short of time on it, but it's called Rocket Stoves and it's called the Rocket Kitchen. If anyone wants to look into it, I'll send a link to Robert. You can send it around to all the participants. Yeah, maybe if you, could, if you could put it in the chat box, that would be great. Yeah, I can uh, get that to do. Yeah, that will work. Um, he's built an entire kitchen. He's got a two burner, 
uh, stove with a small little cob oven and he's cooked a complete turkey or a chicken with french fries and rolls and buns and some beans and rice and as a vegetable all in this outdoor kitchen is made out of cob. You know, I was just thinking that, that um, pizza ovens. That's and the other one is the pizza oven I want. Yeah, there's one, there's a pizza oven or an, an oven, cob oven at the deanery, I yeah. remember. Yeah, so isn't that a form of a rocket stove? Not that one, that's actually, that just is a uh, wood heater. Like they bring the wood inside the uh, stove, and then they pull the coals out. But the heat of the stove is heats the mass of the cob that radiates back in afterwards to cook your meals. Okay. But they can put a rocket stove underneath it and get a clean cob out. Yeah. But after it's, it's, for that it like a, years to do. <laughs> would it be considered a contra fire though? Because I don't know. Air's coming in and going up, and you got a heat riser usually in there. Yeah, so you build a stove on top of your rocket, and you you put a, on that or a door, and it's just a big oven, and then you can get temperatures again up to a thousand degrees inside the oven. There's uh, the same gentleman that has the uh, the three stove is he was playing around with a oven idea. And he was doing it inside a, a, an outdoor workspace because it was raining, but he wanted to vent it. So he ran this vent 17 feet up to the roof, topple shed. And when he had a little clay uh, oven door that he put on, it was raw clay. And when he came back afterwards and he tapped on the, the door, it ceramified. So he had temperatures in that stove and he's used it now to use it as a kiln, to use it as a kiln. You can get enough temperature to ceramify the clay. Wow. In the temperatures in a rocket stove, you can get temperatures for forging out of sticks. Yeah, yeah, you said 3000 degrees with uh, whatever this wood was in California. I think it was California. Yeah. Well, well, you yeah. know, th then I guess it begs the question, have you or anybody else burned other things in rocket stoves? You know, I'm thinking of uh, coal, for example. You could get into hydrocarbons of different kinds. Yeah. We burn knotweed. Knotweed. That's, That's getting rid of knotweed. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can burn anything that's got a carbon-based molecule in it you can burn in a rocket stove now can you we've can had you, uh, can you burn fresh not weed you know just cut where it's still green and full of sap i mean it should be dry <laughs> should be dry okay anything that it's gonna burn it'll burn it's just gonna smolder yeah yeah you'd have to have another fire to go along with it uh we've used uh i've used sawdust in a can it'll work the same way actually the last image on my uh presentation is that I've taken a sawdust can, I put a, a pipe in the middle of it, I pack sawdust in there, there's a hole in the bottom of the can. And then I use a piece of uh, stove pipe, so I put some uh, pink insulation on, and there's enough draw from that to actually continuously burn the sawdust from the inside out to the edge. It takes about a half an hour to do so, so you got a half hour burning of the stove, and it's extremely when I took the pipe off, I went, okay, I can exactly see where the insulation is and how the insulation affects the stove pipe and the heat riser compared to not to. Right on the edge of the, the pink insulation, below it into the stove was perfectly metal, clean metal. Like just at that edge above it is a uh, creative soap building up because that's a little bit cooler and it started to condensate on the side of the pipe. And it's, it's day and night, black and white. You definitely see where that difference is. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm beginning to see how rocket stoves kind of show up in different forms just about everywhere. We keep bees, for example. Okay. And you got the bee smoker. 
So it's a can with a screen at the bottom and then there's a bellows that comes in from the side. Yeah. And so you light a piece of paper, you drop it in there, you throw in a bunch of pine needles or other stuff like that. You pump water. the bellows and then you get a fire going and you want just enough air to create a smolder. You don't want to get a lot of heat and a lot of kind of hot air rising up. So it's kind of yeah. like a, a low speed controlled rocket stove in some way. Uh, I would go that far, but it's a nice smolder, but that's what that syngas is. Uh, so if you take that smoldering fire and you want to get as much syngas as you possibly can, and you pass that through another a couple systems of uh, cooling and con condensation, so you take some of the uh, creosynths out of it, but the methane, propane, butane can still travel through the system. You can take that gas, that syngas, put it into a small four-stroke uh, lawnmower, and run your lawnmower or maybe a little generator and you're using the syngas to do so and that's why your bees don't like it because it's syngas it's that's that poison stuff that burns your eyes yeah 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 I've heard it being called before wood just wood gas and like i've heard of trucks where they had like wood gas fire trucks that's exactly what it is yeah yeah i remember i remember seeing pictures during the it might have been the great depression uh, particularly in Europe, there'd be trucks with a, a, a burner on the back making wood gas. Yeah. And it's, that's how that would be what would power it. Uh, I always wanted to build a truck and drive it to work because at work we have a the alternate uh, methodology for cars, right? An alternate burning source that you can park your car. So if they're thinking electric cars or something. I would love to park my car that was fired up wood gas there. Be nice and close to the building and I'm alternative fuel. Yeah. Uh, Petra's got a question. Are rocket stoves regulated the same way as open fires during Nova Scotia's fire season? Or can you use them year round? You can, um, but you have to get a lot of other people in the province to understand why they're different than an open fire. They'll see fire, they'll say it's open. Uh, but in a rocket stove mass heater where it's contained completely, yes, you can. There are ways of getting it uh, code certified, wet certified. Um, they actually are part of the building code right now. So you can, you can get a mass heater through, uh, but just a little cooker like that, I don't know if you'd get it. The good thing is that they're running correctly, nice and cleanly. There is no smoke, therefore there's no fire department. <laughs> where there's smoke, there's fire. Is that the idea? No, where there's smoke, there's a fire department. Yeah. Because <laughs> we got lots of fire, but no smoke. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll read between the lines on that one, Mike. <laughs> so, so, Mike, are you saying that the... Uh, um, the fire, the, the codes for building houses are such that you can still get insurance if you put in rocket stoves Correct. in your house. Yes, um, there it's what they're called is a alternate uh, fuel fired appliance or like a fireplace. Mm -hmm. um, there's requirements that you have to have that meet to the code requirements like uh, clearances um, mm -hmm. and these things. So you can get your rocket stove designed in a way that a wet certifier can come in and say that it is code approved. Um, so they will wet certify it. Once you've got it wet certified, then you can go to your insurance company, building. Again, the building department doesn't know about enough about them, mm -hmm. understand them enough to be able to say, yeah, I understand them perfectly. Warning, warning on that. A lot of insurance companies are hesitate to insure you, even if your stuff does pass code and is wet certified. If uh, depending on your other, you know, heating systems in the house, they they get very nervous when they see things that are out of the ordinary. This is absolutely true, but you can get insurance because you can get it wet certified. It's not easy. Uh, I know that we had when we moved into the house or I'm in now, there was two stoves, a wood burning stoves, and they basically told us we have to take them out. They didn't care. 
So in the third world, um, burning um, cow manure, for instance, in India is a very, very common way. Yeah. Now, uh, works wonderful uh, on a rocket stove. It w does, okay. What do you do? P Break put it up into chunks. Break, Break it up into chunks. Yeah, okay. All right. Any oh. carbon based dry material will work. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to see that article on the, um, the, the rocket stove kitchen because it would be really interesting how to make something so that you could cook with it in the summer and winter inside the house, but um, it wouldn't add extra heat uh, in the summer, just in the winter. No, it would because you're burning directly inside the house. So you're, the heat that's coming out of the top of the rocket stove is still going into your house. So there's there's not a way to 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 you'd have to yeah you'd have to have like a vent system like mm -hmm. a hood probably commercialized but if you just had this on your back porch and maybe you had a little roof over top of it you could cook out there I've oh okay so I I thought sometimes it was cooking on on top of uh, say if you're using a fifty five gallon drum. Um, which was the, the common way of do, doing those uh, mass heaters. Um, you could still cook on top of that or is that never um, hot enough for that to use that as surface to put a pan on? Uh, you can. Shall you got one minute? I'll just tease you with the video. Please. I'm hoping it works with your bandwidth, the video. Can you see it? Yes. If you turn your video off, it might not jump as much. And go full screen. I'm trying to get to the full screen. So burn chambers, heat risers, you've got a griddle, a griddle burner. Uh-huh. It's oven. Cool. Where is that posted? Can we, there we can see it again. If you, could, you. Okay. If, if, if you can post that link or have you already. I put it in the chat. But yeah. I'll send it. It's in the chat box. So it looks like he's got three rocket stoves side by side. He does. Wow. That's a piece of ceramic he made. <laughs> Not bad for some sticks. Wow. Wow. It's, it's amazing to be able to do all this with the twigs that fall from your trees or from pruning your trees or coppicing them. Oh, there's the chicken. Yeah. <laughs> Hooray for the rocket kitchen. Very nice. So everyone, this is all saved at our Facebook page. And later on, we'll probably be to posting it to our YouTube channel as well. But as of a few minutes, uh, it's running right now on, on the Facebook and it'll, it'll save there. Um, you can go back and see it probably in, in 10 minutes from now. Well, Cam, well thank you, Mike. Uh, Cam, I want to thank you both. Fantastic evening. And uh, everyone, uh, don't hesitate to go to both websites, transitionbay.ca. Uh, you can pick up on everything that's going on. And then also the deaneryproject.com. Um, and you can find out what's going on there. And if you haven't had a chance to get out there to the Deanery Project, I definitely recommend it. It's absolutely fascinating, all the stuff that they've, got, they've already built and uh, things that they continue to do. And you can see Mike's uh, mass space heater while you're at it out there.
Yeah, I was just part of it. It's not mine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's a many people operation to get that one in the building. Well, Mike, we want to thank you for joining us this evening and uh, give our best to Kim as well. And we'll be in touch with her about two 10th anniversary parties coming up. Well, there you are. Great. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I was here the whole time. I just um, was conscious of bandwidth as well. So, <clears throat> yep, we're looking forward to it, Bob. All yep. right. That's we'll great. make it happen. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> You're welcome, everyone. We're going to do a carrot cake. What kind of cake are you going to do? <laughs> Ginger? Already planning ahead. Here we go. <laughs> well, listen, you know what? I was thinking we've got this bike challenge going, and I think that the deanery is building a, a bike machine, and I, we would like at this moment to challenge Transition Bay to make a bike something. Ooh. how's that okay. we will top yeah. your carrot cake if you can make a really uh, a better bike than what we're bike machine than what we're doing aha uh -huh. so it's basically just a bike frame and a chain <laughs> hooked up to a generator isn't that most of what it is we, we have that too but it could be could be making art you could have something that's going to drive a paintbrush to do something or other uh -huh. or it we have someone that's making a really wonderful storytelling sort of thing i don't know just um, bikes can do so much anyway you know we're gonna we've got a few people that like to build stuff and we're gonna put our thinking caps on okay well the, the glove has been what is that expression? I we put has the, been thrown down. Well, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Okay. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining. <laughs> and join us again for upcoming events. Thank you. Lovely to partner with you guys. We'll do 